Welcome to Horteras Presents, a brand agnostic interview podcast that seeks to objectively highlight the happenings within the world of diagnostics. And now, your hosts, Rich Thea and Mickey Yerde. Hello, this is Mickey Yerde for Halteras Associates. And this is Rich Thayer, Managing Partner at Halteras. Today, we are joined by Mohamed Majam. He's Director of Medical Technology at Essentia Institute. Essentia is part of Vitz University in Johannesburg. Mohammed has had a remarkable set of experiences over the last decade in the use of and evaluation of self-tests, particularly for HIV. And now our interview with Mohammed Majam. Welcome, Mohammed. Please tell our listeners a bit about yourself and your fascinating career, and also perhaps describe for our audience what Essentia does and brings to the global health space that other such organizations don't. Thank you, Rich uh, and Mickey, for the invitation. My name is Mohammed Majum. I am the Director for Medical Technologies at Izinsha at Wits University in Johannesburg, South Africa. I've been with the Wits Health Consortium for the last 18 years uh, through various roles. I started out in a clinical trial laboratory as a project manager, managing clinical trials from a laboratory perspective um, and gained a lot of insight into laboratory medicine. Uh, diagnostics, um, and then in 2012, joined uh, the Vits Reproductive Health and HIV Institute, um, where I led one of the largest antiretroviral clinical trials um, for drug optimization, which took place um, in South Africa, Uganda, and India between 2012 uh, and 2016. Um, this was on a low-dose stavidine trial, or D4T, um, which is a very topical drug at the time. Um, but it really allowed me to learn the ropes of clinical trials uh, from a non-laboratory perspective or inclusive of other aspects besides laboratory. And that really got me um, going in, in, in this field. Uh, by background, I'm a scientist uh, with an undergrad in biochemistry and microbiology and genetics um, at Wits University as well. Uh, and I've later done several other courses, including a master's in business administration um, at the university. Um, I'm a Six Sigma black belt professional as well and, and try to use uh, my Six Sigma um, operations uh, management skills um, and process improvement skills in, in everything I do. So in 2019, um, myself along with uh, several other colleagues at the Vits Reproductive Health and HIV Institute decided to form a smaller more innovative unit um, that will focus on early stage innovations. Uh, and that's when we formed Isinsha. Um, Isinsha still forms part of the university. Uh, it is part of the Vits Health Consortium. Uh, however, we have stepped away from large health system strengthening type work to more early scale um, treatment and diagnostics work uh, with a large focus on research capacity building and capacitating young African students um, towards their masters and PhDs. My role in my portfolio encompasses anything to do with uh, diagnostics and digital health uh, with a large focus on self-testing. So I think Isincha's position within inner city of Johannesburg lends itself to a very unique population, a very uh, high prevalence of infectious diseases, and it makes it a very interesting area uh, in which to conduct clinical trials uh, and clinical research. And part of our success over the last um, decade or so in, in conducting these large-scale trials has been our proximity to the populations that we, we need to be testing. Wonderful background. Thank you for sharing. Over the last decade, you and your team have been involved in the assessment of professional use and self-use diagnostics tests in in-field evaluations. We've had the pleasure to work with you and your team in several of these trials. What is the difference between the professional and a self-use test? So self-testing by definition is when a lay user or a non-trained individual uh, performs a clinical test on themselves, collects their own specimen and interprets their own result. By definition, that could lend itself to a whole host of problems if the product is not designed in the correct manner and if it's not usable enough for an ordinary citizen who gets their hand on one of these tests uh, to conduct the tests um, in, in, in the correct manner or fashion. 
So simplistically, a professional use test is a test which is designed with a professional end user or healthcare worker in mind. These tests are designed uh, specifically for professionals, uh, the instructions and the wording around the instructions for the performance of the test, including the background training, uh, is all designed uh, with a professional user in mind. Whereas a self-test is something that an individual who has absolutely no training or no experience with medical technologies, with medical devices, is now going to test themselves. So over the last 10 years, we've tried to, we've been on this journey of trying to get self-test into the market. And the reason being was that specifically for HIV, we were not reaching that last 20, 30, or 40 percent of people living with HIV who, who needed to know their status through traditional methodologies. Uh, these were for various reasons, either individuals uh, not wanting to go to clinics, uh, wait in long queues, unfriendly services. And so home-based testing or self-testing was introduced as a tool to provide confidentiality, uh, a tool that would work against stigmatization, and something that will increase access. And so the journey over the last decade has been one of trying to figure out what type of instructions, support tools, um, need to go in an ideal test kit. What does an ideal home test look like? Uh, what are the various requirements for a test to be usable uh, in the hands of an untrained individual? And so much of our work has focused on trying to take these professional tests and turn them into home-based self-tests. So Mohammed, I think in making these types of assessment, there's this concept of usability. Can you tell us a little bit about what usability is and how it's assessed and some of the challenges that you face in assessing the quality of these tests, particularly with regard to untrained users? Sure. So back in 2015, and, and uh, that's how long our collaboration with, with Halteres has actually uh, been in place. It's remarkable to think that it's been nearly eight years now. Um, the World Health Organization's pre-qualification department had not yet specified its uh, technical specification series for home-based testing uh, or self-tests. Uh, and in the absence of that, the Halteres team, along with the Vitsar HI team and the Gates Foundation at that time, looked at what would make sense in terms of assessing a product for home use. We had then looked at what the FDA had done to approve Orishua's usage uh, in the United States. Um, we looked at what uh, the requirements for CE marking was for Biosure and the French Autotest VIH uh, for the European market. And we took components of those together with just some basic common sense in terms of designing a framework for testing these products in the hands of lay users. And the first point which actually made sense was, can an ordinary person do this test? So usability speaks precisely to that point, is that if we had to pull somebody off the street and provided them with a test with no support besides for the product and the instruction for use, would they be able to complete the test correctly without any assistance? So usability is a measure of that performance of a test as it stands, as it is provided to the user. And so a lot of factors play a role in trying to get usability of a test to an adequate standard. The instruction for use firstly needs to be stripped of all jargon, it needs to be simplified as much as possible. We need to use simplistic language. We need to swap out words for pictures. We need to cut down the number of steps. And we need to ensure that somebody without much of an education, uh, somebody that may be illiterate, somebody whose first language is not the language of the instruction for use, is able to pick up the product and able to pick up the instruction for use and complete the test correctly so that we get an accurate result. So usability is about getting an accurate result by a lay user provided with just the, the test kit and the instruction for use in front of them. So we've spent a lot of time 
over the last um, eight to 10 years, learning about usability, learning about what works and what doesn't work, what type of language is acceptable to the population, uh, what's not acceptable, making minor modifications to pictures and pictorials uh, that will allow lay users to actually uh, do the test correctly. And over the years, we've seen, um, you know, we've seen people do very weird and wonderful things. Uh, and from my experience with the HIV self-test, we know that um, people are inherently going to make mistakes. There is no standard that has been specified as to what an acceptable usability is. So is it 80%, is it 85%, is it 90% or above? So in our measurement of usability, we've seen patients do various different things. Uh, for example, with one of the oral-based HIV test kits, there was a buffer that was provided for the test uh, device to be placed into. And we had some clients thinking that the, the buffer was, in fact, a mouthwash or mouth rinse, and they needed to utilize it in that manner. We've had people pricking themselves with a lancet uh, and then not transferring any blood uh, and expecting the test to run with just, you know, on its own. Uh, so we've seen we've seen everything over the course of the last ten years, and it's really helped us to um, design future tests uh, based on the experiences that we've gained. <laughs> That's great. It is amazing, isn't it? So what what does a typical usability trial look like? How do you conduct it? So in a usability trial, we often look at three main objectives. The first objectives would be on actual test performance or failure modes. So for that, we would provide a patient a test kit and a non-interfering observer, which is often a trained healthcare worker or a nurse, would sit back and watch all of the steps of the process from the point of opening the test to looking at the various components, uh, to whether it's a blood-based test and somebody cleaning off their finger to lance themselves, to transferring their blood specimen or in the case of an oral test, transferring the oral specimen. So we'd watch each of the steps of the process and we'd mark it using a basic checklist of yes and no, making comments where uh, a patient has done something out of the ordinary. And at the end of it, we will calculate the usability based on the average of the test of the step performance and on then of the overall test performance. So the first objective, like I said, is uh, failure modes um, or correct completion of tests. The second one being label comprehension. So how well does the uh, participant or the lay user understand the key messaging that is provided on the instruction for use, on the packaging, on the box? What should they do? What should they not do? And we try to assess, does the person understand you know, certain aspects of what to do if you test positive, what to do if you test negative, what should you, what shouldn't you do um, with a test kit. Uh, for example, drinking buffer is something you should not do. Um, and does the person know that you should not do something uh, like that? The third component is mock result interpretation. And in our usability assessments, we don't provide the user with an actual result. And the reason we do so is that we don't want any preconceived notions, ideas, or previous results to interfere with the interpretation of the result, nor will we get all the variations of results um, sometimes available. So what we would do is randomly provide each of the variation of results to each participant for them to interpret. So whether it be a positive or low positive, uh, a negative or invalid for test line control or control line failure, we'd provide the four or five different types of results in a, in a randomized manner and ask each participant to read it and to see how well that correlates. So those are the three components of a typical usability assessment. I believe a usability assessment can be as small as 10 to 15 participants uh, to get an indication of a test's performance. But typically, the, the WHO uh, dossier requirements usually require around 200 participants uh, from an intended use setting. Um, and that's more or less, you know, how we've designed our protocols. So once you've seen the issues with usability, 
how can a product be modified to prevent most of these usability errors? You talked about this a little bit with instructions for use, but does it sometimes require actually changing the design of the product itself or sometimes both? Yes, it's, it's, it's a very iterative process um, in terms of the development of a self-test. It often is trial and error for a manufacturer when, when developing um, their instructions for use, especially if it's the first time that a manufacturer is transitioning from professional use products to self-test use products. Um, I think there is a, a very specific change in strategy that is required. Um, and once a manufacturer picks that up and, and understands what sort of design elements work for a self-test, I think uh, transitioning other parts of their portfolio actually works. And I've seen this with one of the diagnostic companies that we've worked with uh, now pursuing self-tests for uh, STIs and for hepatitis, um, how easily they were able to transition from having the HIV test to the other disease state test versus when they moved from professional HIV test to, to self-test. So like I said, it's a very iterative process um, of understanding what works and what doesn't work. And you often have to break down the instruction for use into each individual step and understanding um, is the sequence in the correct order, um, is the wording correct. You know, you sometimes would actually go and stress upon a single word on the instruction for use. Uh, to ensure is it placed correctly, is it not placed correctly. Um, so I think that by and large is is where our skill set comes in, um, our experience over the last few years, understanding what the lay users in a South African context would find acceptable. And what's been good to note is that we've run these studies, not just in South Africa, but we've partnered with sites in other parts of the world um, and the same instruction for use that we had worked on the design of and the usability uh, improvements of have been translatable into other settings. So, we've, for example, for HIV, we've worked with sites in, in Vietnam. And, you know, you'd think that the market in Vietnam to the market in South Africa would be very different. Uh, obviously, the language is completely different. But the instruction for use and product was translatable and we saw equally high usability in that setting. We've worked with partner sites in, in Congo and in Senegal, um, and more recently for hepatitis C, working with countries in, in Eastern Europe and Asia as well. Um, so showing that if you get the core of your product correct, if you get your instructions for use correct from the get-go, that is then easily translatable um, into other settings. Um, and I think the South African market, with its uh, diversity, um, its education levels, uh, which you know vary from from no education to very highly qualified individuals, um, provides a good uh, testing ground for for most diagnostics and devices because we can then see how well it works in in this very diverse population. You know, I can remember that uh, as your team and you gained so much knowledge about these errors, sitting with you uh, in South Africa, looking at a company's instructions for use before you actually did the trial and being able to look at that and you being able to tell them, well, you're going to have to change this or you're going to have to rearrange this or do this a different way. And it helped so very much. You know, it prevented doing what was probably going to be an, uh, an unsuccessful usability study and turn it into a successful one. Yeah, so I think that's um, a very uh, common thing that we, we see. And oftentimes, you know, we have to find a middle ground, especially where we are evaluating a product in terms of how much information we are able to say to a manufacturer because we are not, by extension, their R&D arm. So there's certain things which are obviously propriety of other companies uh, that you know, so it is a juggling act that we've we've often found, but we try our best to be able to provide recommendations in a very structured, non uh, proprietary, uh, bending way, uh, so that we don't you know uh, fall short of any manufacturers. So it is a bit of a, a juggling act, 
uh, but we, we do try to provide manufacturers with recommendations we believe could work. And often you can, you can look at an instruction for use and, and know whether it's, it's destined to fail um, or, or you know, destined to succeed. Uh, that's why I often recommend that before manufacturers go down the road of investment into a large trial, that they often do a smaller um, preliminary usability evaluation so you can actually pick up some of these problems before you, know, you actually step into these, these bigger evaluations. Um, and, I, and I've seen this you know, work quite successfully for, for a few companies. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. It's certainly clear that the contributions of you and your team at RHI in the world of self-testing have been very useful. In addition to evaluating the performance of these tests in users' hands, we are aware of another exciting area that your research has extended, and that's around types of delivery models. What are some of the innovative approaches you have tried, some of the lessons learned, and some of the remaining challenges in delivering these products to market? Yeah, so part of uh, the the exciting bits of of working uh, in a very innovative industry and a very innovative organization was that we were able to firstly evaluate these products, um, but secondly, actually go and see how these tests work in field. So a large part of my portfolio is uh, centered around implementation science, um, and part of that is looking at how well uh, these tests work within the uh, various populations. So we, we know that these tests work, that they're usable enough, that the perform- clinical performance uh, is, is good enough to uh, put into the hands of untrained users. Um, so now how do we find the right people? How do we get the test to the intended populations? So specifically to HIV um, and, and with South Africa being the, 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 the biggest um, population of uh, people living with HIV anywhere in the world, um, it made sense for us to to do an implementation project uh, in the country. So back in 2017, um, I led the Self-Test Africa or STAR project, which took place in in several countries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, of which South Africa was one of them. And for that implementation project, uh, UnitAid, the donor of this project had uh, provided uh, close to two and a half million tests for the the scale up of of testing in the, in, in the country, um, all towards sort of a market shaping angle um, to see whether the there's an appetite in the market, but also through which channels we were going to try and get the test kits out there. So there's certainly no one size fits all approach to distribution of tests or uh, getting tests into the hands of the right people. It really comes down to uh, who you're trying to um, target and how would you go about finding them and what sort of linkage tools or uh, considerations do you need to take into place when, when looking at them. So for example, for HIV, our focus was on uh, men between the ages of 18 and 45 within the general population. Um, it was young women and adolescent girls between the ages of 15 and, and 35. Um, it was your key population, such as the female sex workers, um, MSM, uh, intravenous drug users. Um, and those are the type of populations that we were targeting for uh, our HIV self-testing program. Now, it I think goes without saying that the way you're going to try and find um, a, 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 a man in the general population versus how you're going to find uh, a young girl um, would require a very different approach. So for that, we, we designed our implementation and distribution models precisely to who we were trying to get to. So for example, men, where would we find them? primarily in workplaces. So we targeted male-dominated workplaces such as mining, construction, agriculture, oil and gas, security, um, or, uh, industries in which there's you know, 7 to 80% um, male domination. Uh, and through this, we were able to get to those men, many of whom never tested for HIV before, or at least had not tested within the last year. For young people, we were 
finding them at malls, we're finding them at schools, at universities, uh, within community settings. So over the course of the STAR program, we had implemented 13 different models or ways of getting to people. And this, you know, this traversed public sector programs, private sector programs, facility base, secondary distribution, um, and it was all encompassing. I'd be lying if I if I told you that we were successful in everything we did. Uh, we failed in certain distribution models, which just were not taken up. Whereas we had a lot of success in certain models, which we just worked. But it all comes down to understanding your market, making sure that you are taking a tool that is fit for purpose and putting it into an environment that is fit for usage. Um, and once you merge all of those things together, you actually get a very good distribution uh, program going. But you can't just distribute tests. Um, and, and one of the biggest challenges that self-tests face is what happens next. So what we figured out was getting tests into the hands of the right people is actually not that difficult. What happens next? How do we link that person to a result? And how do we link them into care thereafter is the number one challenge that self-testing faces. And we've seen this over COVID as well. We've seen that countries that have been hesitant to launch COVID self-testing programs, the number one reason has been because the government does not then have control as to what happens to the result. It can't go into a surveillance program. It can't be counted. Did it actually happen if it can't be counted? And that's, I think, the, the biggest challenge that self-tests face. Um, and I think there's an inherent problem in that because for me, a self-test is about creating access and about removing barriers to access. And it's not about specifically counting. Um, and I think that's where a lot of policymakers and Department of Health officials don't get it. Yes, that's uh, the fascinating research that you've been able to conduct there. You know, in the course of all of this work that you've been doing, you've come across many exciting innovations uh, in testing technologies and devices and communications tools. What are some of the exciting advances in self-collection, self-testing, and digital health tools and digital reporting that you can share with us? And where do you think these fields are going? Yeah, so I've said it from very early on in the evolution of, of self-testing was that the self-tests or diagnostics companies that are involved in manufacturing of these tests have brought uh, a level of innovation uh, to a very otherwise stagnant lateral flow market. You know, a lateral flow test was a lateral flow test uh, was a lateral flow test. And what we found very quickly with the um, self-test was that manufacturers understood the brief was that we needed to minimize the number of steps. We needed to simplify the testing process as much as possible. And so we saw tests with integrated lancets and integrated buffers, uh, integrated capillaries and sample distribution mechanisms. Um, we saw manufacturers that came out with flow through technology rather than lateral flow. Uh, and so results were obtainable within a minute rather than the traditional 10 to 15 minutes. So these manufacturers really brought out what I found the best within the industry um, and a level of innovation that we hadn't seen for some time. And, and this comes down to trying to make a product as simplistic as possible, yet retaining all the components that are necessary. So we've seen uh, a lot of advancements in, in this space. When it comes to the digital tools and digital support, I think that's a, a very important component. Um, of uh, a self-testing product. Uh, they go hand in hand. The digital tool can either be there as a support tool, so to guide the patient on their journey from the point of obtaining the test through the process of completing the test to understanding their result and loading their result and understanding what to do next. So for that, we've, we've worked with many innovative digital health companies, uh, looking at um, specific e-readers, looking at utilizing WhatsApp for business or so WhatsApp uh, chatbots for patient support, um, looking at self-reporting mechanisms through interactive voice response systems, um, patient apps. 
there's a lot going on um, in in the sort of linkage and reporting field uh, in the digital health space. Now we're seeing a lot more companies building in uh, screening algorithms, uh, risk-based algorithms using AI and machine learning uh, so that we can better target populations, um, we can use it for surveillance, but also for targeting our interventions into areas which actually need it. So yes, it's it's um, a really uh, innovative space to be in, in, in the self-testing world. And we've seen, you know, more and more uh, products and more and more disease states starting to talk about development of self-tests. Now, this conversation has been largely around self-testing and self-testing devices perhaps in part to get around the uh, age-old challenges with remote sampling and sending samples to central laboratories for testing and loss to follow up and that sort of thing. Yet there's a lot of activity today still around improved sample self-collection devices. Um, is that an area that you're working on? Do you see uh, any opportunities still um, there for remote sample collection, stabilizing the sample and still utilizing central laboratory capacities? I certainly think that there is, there's an, there's a space for it within the the market. Uh, not all tests can be done as a point of care test. Um, some require specialist laboratories uh, or specialized uh, techniques, and so I definitely think there is a place in the market for self collection. Um, and I think we've learned sufficient lessons from sample collections um, through uh, self testing which could be leveraged and vice versa. I think uh, self-sampling existed well before uh, self-testing uh, and a lot of lessons were learned from, from self-sampling that were then used for the self-testing industry. Uh, so I don't specifically have any ongoing projects on, on self-collection, um, but I think it's definitely an area which has a lot of promise. Um, especially where you're looking at rural settings, um, settings in which there's limited access uh, to specialized laboratory techniques. Uh, there's definitely room for that. Uh, we saw it in, in COVID. We worked on a few self-sampling projects where um, people were, you know, in the heart of uh, COVID in 2020, 2021, uh, people were, were afraid to come out of their uh, homes. Uh, and we worked on some self-collection um, a sort of evaluations, could we develop uh, digital end-to-end -end systems from the point of sample collection so it could be uploaded in a lab without any paper, without any uh, potential for um, disease spread. So yes, I definitely think there's uh, room for self-sampling uh, um, and uh, yeah, I would be very keen to get my hands on a test that, um, or a platform that can do this. Mohammed, we've talked mostly about diagnostic initiatives at Essentia so far. What, what kind of other activities are you involved in that you can tell us about? Yeah, so uh, I, I head up the, the diagnostics or medical technologies field. Um, however, it, it only makes up, uh, you wouldn't believe it, 20% uh, of our Essentia business. The majority of what we do is actually um, you know, mostly based on, on treatment trials. Um, and we've been uh, one of the spearheaded organizations when it came to um, the introduction of dolitegravir uh, from the clinical trials perspective, but also from the implementation of it, the policy writing. Um, now with CabLA, um, a lot of work being done um, in the injectable space uh, that we're working on as well uh, as an organization. One of the unique uh, projects that we're working on at the moment is the uh, decentralized delivery of PrEP. Um, and that is uh, through private pharmacies in uh, in South Africa. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to to cut out one of the barriers to access for, especially for young people, um, and making them have another avenue of, of being able to access their PrEP uh, through these pharmacies. So if somebody is at a private pharmacy, a Walgreens, for example, you don't know whether they're there to buy supplements or they're there to buy uh, hygiene products or getting their PrEP. So we thought it's a, a nice way of getting the um, PrEP out to young people within a very safe uh, space. We've coupled that with HIV testing or HIV self-testing for monitoring of PrEP. Uh, we've looked at online delivery of PrEP as well. Uh, so we're trying to shift the boundaries in terms of decentralization of services within the PrEP space uh, as well. 
we were very busy over the COVID period, as you'd understand, uh, many research institutes and organizations were. So from my side, uh, heavily involved in the COVID diagnostics, both for professional use and for uh, self-testing. We've seen a flurry of, of respiratory tests, uh, which are multiplex in nature. Uh, so COVID flu, COVID RSV, you know, more and more of these tests coming to the market, which we are evaluating for usability and performance. Um, for, from a COVID perspective, we were one of the few countries or few sites uh, globally that was involved in the Molnipiravir uh, evaluations um, very early on. Um, but we also looked at other formulations in the early part of uh, COVID when they were talking about anti-malarials um, that could be used uh, for COVID treatment. Uh, so I think we were one of the few organizations that were actually able to successfully complete full recruitment um, of a treatment or prophylaxis trial uh, during the COVID period. Um, I think it comes down to uh, our agility, flexibility, and ability to, to reach populations in a very uh, innovative, decentralized way. Um, so yeah, I think that's a major part of what we're doing at Isensha at the moment. And, and like I said in the, in the start, um, we have a large focus on research capacity building. And then the new area of work is really on non-communicable diseases. Um, you know, um, HIV on its own is no longer as much of a problem as it was 15 to 20 years ago, but now you have colliding pandemics of HIV and obesity, uh, HIV and hypertension, HIV and sleep disorders, HIV and mental health. So these are all areas that we are now getting into. Um, we'll be introducing our sleep clinic um, within the next uh, few months. Um, we'll be developing an obesity clinic, uh, obesity management clinic, where we'll be looking at doing very similar for what we did for HIV in terms of trying to bring the cost of drugs down, um, getting new formulations available, you know, getting, uh, getting new treatments available for, for obesity, hypertension, um, and trying to bring some of the lessons we've learned from the HIV world to non-communicable diseases as well. That's really interesting. I'm just wondering about the rather unique position that you sent you in, in that you're doing diagnostics and therapeutics, and therefore you can think about the interplay of those you know, test and treat, et cetera. Yeah, so we, we've we actually uh, had um, a COVID test and treat project, which we worked with a uh, diagnostic manufacturer who had a, a very good device that we were able to take out into the field uh, and have people screened and tested for COVID in the field and immediately refer them on to treatment. Um, and so test and treat, yes, it's a massive component of what we're trying to achieve I think Isincha's strength in both the diagnostics and therapeutics uh, world, coupled with our experience in uh, clinical trials, but also in implementation science, uh, makes it a very good area for, you know, for new technologies to come to be investigated uh, because we provide such a breadth of, of services um, to the industry. That's great. Now, certainly we've seen the example of the success of test and treat around hepatitis C. Um, and their opportunities for diabetes and tuberculosis. It sounds like a fascinating area you're involved in. Yeah, hepatitis C self-testing is what I'm currently uh, very much involved in. Uh, I've just completed the evaluation of the diagnostics for WHO pre-qualification. Uh, we're now at the stage of implementation science, and we're trying to see how do we get to the intended population. So it's a very specific population in South Africa. We're looking at uh, intravenous drug users. We're looking at homeless individuals. I'm sure there's a more uh, politically correct term that I should be using. And, uh, you know, those that are involved in um, sexualized drug use. So we now trying to get hepatitis tests in treat, as you said, utilizing self-tests uh, for hepatitis out there. But I think, yeah, like you said, you know, there's a lot of more disease states that we should be and could be moving into. I think the COVID pandemic has uh, opened up the, the world of self-care a little bit more than we've seen in the past. I think this, the pace at which we transitioned from professional testing only to allowance of self-testing in many markets uh, sort of cut down a lot of the barriers. So many countries were but hesitant to introduce self-tests into their uh, public spaces, but COVID-19 and the, the need for, for home testing, self-testing really pushed that agenda quickly. 
and we're seeing more and more countries now embrace uh, self-testing as as a way of of getting people tested. How do you think that the pandemic has impacted the public's understanding of diagnostics and their willingness to to use self-tests? And do you think that's going to drive the need for more and better tests in addition to what's available now? Yes, what I found over the pandemic was that everybody had become an expert <laughs> on, on, on <laughs> diagnostics um, and when they should test themselves and how they should test themselves. And everybody had an opinion about, you know, how how uh, specific or sensitive a, or accurate a, a COVID antigen or antibody test was. You know, these were words that were completely Greek to uh, many people prior to uh, COVID-19. And all of a sudden you had ordinary people talking about I've taken an antigen test and I have antibody titers. You know, that was not something that the ordinary citizen would have been interested in the past. Uh, what the lateral flow assay was versus what a molecular diagnostic and, and people, you know, I only do PCR because it's more accurate. Um, I certainly think the pandemic created new awareness of infectious diseases to an extent we've never seen before. Um, like I said, we had a lot of armchair uh, experts and critics when it came to much of the management of, of COVID-19. But I think it also created this renewed awareness and understanding of the infectious diseases diagnostics market, which and I think a bit of an appreciation of what goes into it. So I certainly believe that um, one of the uh, unintended consequences of the uh, pandemic um, response has been uh, greater knowledge uh, from the general population around diagnostics, around home-based testing, around lateral flow, around you know professional use tests. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly think that it's 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 paving, if not have paved the way for for more self tests to to enter the market. Um, we 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 had to have a shift because um, in many countries with strict lockdowns. There were no options for treatment or facility-based care. Um, and so the only avenues were pharmacies. So you had to self-medicate. You had to order things online and get them delivered home. Um, and so home-based care was actually becoming the norm. Um, and so we've seen this shift. I think it's up to us now to take advantage of it. Um, governments that were hesitant to embrace um, home-based treatment and, 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 and testing um, need to be pushed a little bit more now to say, yes, the population were able to do this. They were able to take care of themselves. They were able to self-report their result. They were able to self-medicate. So why can we not try it for other disease states as well? There's always going to be space for specialists. There's always going to be space for a burgeoning healthcare system. But I think the more we, we empower people to take self-care into their own hands, the less burden we'll see on the healthcare system. And I think we'll see better outcomes. Yeah, well said. You know, I think one of the surprises for me in the work we've done with you over the past and particularly HIV is that the, the performance of the tests in the self-users' hands are comparable to the best laboratory tests. You know, that's a surprise. And I think a lot of people don't realize that's true. And one of the problems we've had is that what's the first thing that happens when someone goes to a clinic after they take a self-test? They get another test at the clinic to confirm. And that adds cost over time. Do you think we're going to get to a point where those self-tests will be used alone in making the treatment decision? I think we're starting to see that shift starting to happen uh, within the HIV space. Uh, I just need to qualify that. Um, not necessarily for treatment right now, but more for prophylaxis and for PrEP. Oh. So we're starting to see the shift where uh, the result of a self-test does not require further confirmatory testing for initiation of PrEP uh, within a specific period of time. Um, I think we will get there. I think it's going to take some time before we do get to a point. Um, remember, one of the main goals of, of self-tests is to triage out negatives. And I think that still remain, should remain the focus um, because that removes the burden. So I would take having to do a confirmatory test on a prospective positive if it means that I've removed 10 negatives from the system because you're making efficiency cost savings uh, in that respect, allowing 
the healthcare worker to spend more time counseling and talking and treating uh, the positive patient. And I think one of the challenges we face with loss to follow up or uh, treatment discontinuation or non-adherence is that our counseling and support has been inadequate. So now that we are able to place more emphasis on those aspects, um, you know, this is, that's an ideal world scenario that we can we can remove neg- 10 negatives and spend that amount of time on a positive. Obviously, it may not play out as such. But I do think that we are moving towards um, an era in which we can start seeing that. And it's not just for self-test. You know, we've spoken about the test and treat. And I think there's an even greater role for point of care to be playing within these decentralized settings for purposes of test and treat by trained community health workers um, in settings where you would ordinarily either not test or have to utilize specialized laboratories. So I think there's middle ground as well that which, which can be reached where we can have uh, trained users with highly sensitive specific diagnostics um, actually work in decentralized settings to, to test people and get them onto treatment sooner than they would if we looked only at facility-based or if we looked only at self-testing-based uh, programs. Great. This has been a great discussion. Yeah. I have one last question. Yeah. Okay. So as you look out there at the unmet needs that remain in uh, these various diseases, what are some of the things you'd like to see manufacturers develop that they haven't so far? I think the there's space in the market for really good multiplex tests or platforms which can provide various types of tests or access to tests in a very uh, confined space and time. So we've seen it with um, with COVID now, like I mentioned earlier, we have the COVID flu A, flu B, RSV tests. Um, and I'd like to really see more and more of these multiplex tests come out. We're seeing a syphilis HIV combo test come out now. I've seen hepatitis A, B, C platforms come out. Um, I think that's the way of the future. I think a lot more companies are moving towards um, one single cartridge, multiple strips. Um, I think that's really a way of the future. Um, I think different diseases require different responses. We're seeing more and more STI-based self-tests come to the market. Um, I've been working on a self-test for syphilis uh, quite recently. Um, and there's, you know, self-collection for for other SDIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, as well that, you know, has been spoken about. Um, so I think we just need to start realizing the potential that um, self-sampling and self-care, self-testing as a whole can actually bring to the market. Very good. Well, great conversation. Really wonderful. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your time, Mohammed. As we expected, you've been just a fountain of information. We've learned a lot, and we hope our listeners enjoy this and find it very useful. Well said, Mickey. Yes, Mohammed, thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen, for the invitation. And uh, yeah, look forward to one day seeing you guys in the flesh again. Uh, but thank you very much for the invitation. Look forward to it. Holteras Presents is produced by Holteras Associates, a U.S.-based bioscience consultancy that provides strategic and tactical services in the areas of diagnostics, medical devices, and life science research to clients of all sizes. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the episode are solely those of the individuals involved, and Holteras Associates is not responsible for any errors or omissions or for the results obtained from the use of this information. The information provided in this episode is for informational or educational purposes only and is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Holteras Associates would like to say thank you to this episode's guests or guests and thank you for listening to this episode of Holteras Presents. Thank you.